Hi, I'm Daniel Smith, Southwest Regional Agronomist for the Nutrient Pest Management Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in Extension. Today I'm going to talk to you about herbicides and cover crops. First thing to keep in mind is what is a cover crop versus a forage crop? A cover crop is when no biomass is harvested and is usually planted for soil conservation purposes. A forage crop is where we're wanting to harvest that biomass through either grazing or mechanical harvest. The cover crops can certainly be utilized as forage, but there's a few things that we should think about before we plant them to ensure success. Most pesticide labels may or may not have cover crop data, but they usually have forage crop data that we should reference for rotational restrictions, and we should plan our pesticide applications and cover cropping around these rotational restrictions if we intend to harvest these for feed. So we look at an example. We look at several herbicide labels where we're looking at winter rye and we're looking at these rotational restrictions. So a rotational restriction on a herbicide label tells us how long we have to wait between herbicide application and when we can plant a crop that's going to be harvested that potentially may have some negative impacts from these herbicides being applied and thus we want to limit the exposure of that food crop to those herbicide residues. So for herbicide A here we look at the herbicide label and it says do not rotate to food or feed crops other than those listed below for all other crops not listed, wait at least 12 months following the last application. Barley, oats, rye, and wheat may be planted four and a half months following treatment. We look at herbicide B, um, and it has similar language, except for the rotational use for this herbicide is 11 to 18 months, depending on the herbicide rate. So this is something we should be thinking about when we're planning our herbicide applications this year is, well, am I going to plant a cover crop in the fall that I'm then going to want to graze or harvest for forage value the next spring? If so, I need to examine that rotational restriction to make sure that I'm not going to have a problem when it comes next spring when I want to harvest it. And there may still be a herbicide rotational restriction on that field. We look at another example, and this particular herbicide has cover crops right on the label. And the language is, is fairly clear, and it says cover crops are not grazed by livestock nor harvested for food. And these cover crops are pl being planted for mostly soil and, and ecology-based reasons out in the field. Um, we look at using these herbicides and then planting a cover crop, and it says on the label that significant injury may occur if we're not following these full setback periods. Um, Often on these labels also is included some language about doing a, a field or a small scale bioassay. That way we're testing for these residuals and seeing if our cover crop seed will germinate and survive any potential residue that's out in the field, thus saving us from seeding an entire field and having a failure or having an issue down the road where we really can't harvest this biomass from this field because we do have a rotational restriction still in place. We look at an example through pictures to better illustrate this. We have herbicide A here on the top and herbicide B. We're applying both these herbicides on May 1st and you can see I'm planting green into a cover crop. Four and a half months go by and it's September 15th and it's time to harvest our silage corn. So we have our, our field of silage corn harvested and I want to plant some winter rye out there for a cover crop. I want to hold the soil in place. Maybe I'll go ahead and graze that cover crop but I, I should look at my herbicide label and just see if I can legally do that or not. When I look at my herbicide label, herbicide A is gonna allow me to do it because there's been four and a half months. Herbicide B, however, though, has an 11 month rotational restriction. So it'd be legal to plant my forage crop on April 1st the following year, and I'd have no rotational restriction. I could still go ahead and plant my cover crop. I just not have any forage harvest option, and any herbicide carryover from that herbicide onto that cover crop would be the responsibility of the producer. Um, and, and clearly, if we had some herbicide carryover, that may injure the cover crop, that may reduce the stand, it may result in a stand failure. So that's a pretty significant risk. But as far as um, being able to plant a forage crop, we've got to wait those 11 months. And then clearly the next spring, herbicide A, after four and a half months in planting that cover crop, you know, we could harvest that for forage. However, the, the, the other application, herbicide B, we'd have to just terminate that cover crop um, and we could plant into it. Still have great weed suppression benefits if it still have um, some, some soil conservation benefits, obviously, but we would not be able to use that for forage. We look at herbicide persistence and carryover. Um, this is when we, we see reduced stands of cover crops out in the field, and they may not be noticeable. Um, when we drive by in the pickup truck and look at that field, we may not see a decreased stand of cover crops, but when we go out and scout, we may find areas of the field 
We may find a whole field that has less cover crop than a neighboring field that we plant in the same day. That's when we should start to think about, gosh, maybe there's some herbicide carryover issues going on out here. So we have two pictures here of a radish planting. We have a non-treated plot, nice stand of radish, and then we have um, some herbicide carryover, a severe stand reduction of the radish. You can see some injury occurred on that radish. And so how does this happen? This happens when we apply a residual herbicide and it sticks around for a little bit longer than intended. Sometimes it doesn't stick around for longer than intended. It's just that length of the residual is, is that long that we have the, enough herbicide out in the soil that's gonna negatively impact a cover crop. And in that particular instance, that would be maybe an interseeding pass where there's only 20 to 30 days between application and, and establishment. And this is where looking at our herbicide labels and doing some label research is very important if we're gonna use cover crops and residual herbicides in our crop rotation. We look at the properties um, that influence herbicide carryover and persistence. We think about the chemical properties of the herbicide and more particularly the half-life of the herbicide, the rate of the herbicide application, the soil pH, heavy soils, and high pH equals longer residual of that herbicide often. Uh, the organic matter content of the soil, the amount of pl surface plant residue and tillage. So the tillage is going to dilute these residues. We think about temperature and rainfall. Less rainfall equals longer residual of these herbicides in most cases. And then the microbes in the soil and how are they going to break down this herbicide. So when we look at an example from the farm landscape of herbicide carryover, this field's in southern Wisconsin. Um, and we dig into scouting this nice stand of cover crops a little bit closer, we find that something's missing or stunted. So we look at this photo on the tailgate and we see that there's a nice healthy stand of peas that we dug up from along the edge of the field. But when we move into the field farther, we get this stunted plant and we see a lot of the, the pea population had actually been reduced throughout that field. And we start to look at that pea plant a little bit closer and we see some stunting. We see the nodes are, are a little bit closer together. We see some clear herbicide injury. And this was from a herbicide that was applied about three months prior to cover crop establishment, had some rotational restrictions on it, um, and then our weather conditions were not were favorable for um, some herbicide carryover to take place. We look at a little a few more examples of this, and we look at some research that was done several years ago at the University of Wisconsin Madison's Agricultural and Life Sciences Research Station at Arlington, and we see in our non-treated plots we have this nice nice healthy stand of annual ryegrass with about 66% cover is the number in the white box. Um, so this green cover, um, about 66% of the soil is covered with this cover crop. When we start to compare that to other herbicide treatments, we can see that's decreased significantly depending on what herbicides used. So we're seeing some herbicide carryover in these plots. Moving on, we can think about what to do in the spring with our cover crops. And we can think about our cover crops becoming spring weeds if they're not managed properly. So our, our first slide here shows a photo of a nice healthy stand of winter rye and annual ryegrass. Clearly a very healthy cover crop, providing some great benefits. When we look at the slide on the right, is a nicely terminated cover crop that we can plant back into. So we often get this question, well, is it possible to have herbicide resistant cover crops? And we look at some of the herbicide resistant cases from across the world, we find out that Italian ryegrass, better known as annual ryegrass, shows resistance to five herbicide side of action groups in 14 states in the US and some countries across the world. So when we think about this, um, this is also where some of our annual ryegrass seed is produced. So we should be cautious when we're using annual ryegrass and always have a really good termination plan for annual ryegrass to prevent it from going to seed. Oftentimes when we're terminating annual ryegrass, it's two to three weeks before it even thinks about producing seed, so we, we shouldn't have, have a huge ex extreme issue of an escape of annual ryegrass, but it's something to keep in mind in our management plan. We think about seed production in a little bit more in depth. We, we think about how quickly these cover crops can flower and produce seed in the spring. And certain cover crops can overwinter from these seeds, such as rye, buckwheat, and, and hairy vetch. They all overwinter and then they produce seed the next year. So this first photo here, is, is my hand and, and that's buckwheat seed and that's about 60 days after buckwheat was planted in a research trial at the Lancaster Agricultural Research Station. Moving on to the next photo, that's winter rye and it's uh, near mid-June and it's starting to think about producing viable seed as well. As is the, the next slide on the back of a tailgate is annual ryegrass so that's producing viable seed near the end of May. And then finally the uh, last photo is from that southern Wisconsin field again and this is one that we often don't see go to seed in Wisconsin, that's radish. Uh, radish actually produced seed, 
um, in this particular field and could become a weed if we didn't think about it for the next growing season. We think about our cover crops that overwinter versus the ones that winter kill and we find some variability in annual ryegrass. So we had did some field studies where in 2013 and 2014, three out of our four varieties survived the winter. However, in 2014, 2015, all of our, all of our annual ryegrass rather, um, winter killed. We look at the chart on the right hand of the screen and we see some of our most common cover crops starred. We see annual ryegrass may overwinter. Oats is always, going to over, is always going to winter kill. Winter rye is always going to overwinter. Radish will always winter kill. Crimson clover may or may not winter kill. It depends on where you're at in the state of Wisconsin and depends on what kind of winter we've had. And then red clover will typically always overwinter. We look at how to terminate these cover crops once they've, we've overwintered. Um, obviously, if we're planting some of these grass species that winter kill, we're going to have a nice seed bed to plant back into that mulch from the, the terminated cover crop via winter kill. But if we need to do some termination, what are some of our other tools? And crimping can be a great tool to have in the toolbox, especially with winter rye. To crimp the winter rye and plant soybeans back into has been shown in Wisconsin to produce a great soybean yield and provide great weed control. We think about mowing some of our cover crops so we can get away with mowing some of our grass species. However, be uh, mindful that some of these cover crops will quickly regrow, such as annual ryegrass will regrow very similarly to the, the grass in your lawn. Winter rye, if we mow it towards the end of the vegetative and into the reproductive stages of life, we can expect very little regrowth to occur um, and, and we can be fine with planting just a second herbicide pass to clean up weeds and any escaped rye plants that survived through that mowing pass. And then we can think about doing some tillage. However, I'm not going to recommend tillage passes unless we need to for our crop rotation and our cropping system because tillage is going to really um, undo some of those benefits of the cover crop that we've seen such as reducing soil erosion, building soil health, um, and, and that type of thing. Finally, we have herbicides in the toolbox. We can think about using glyphosate burn down pass, but we want to have good weather conditions at, at termination timing. Brassica termination, um, we're not going to really have to think about terminating these brassicas in Wisconsin because they're going to winter kill. Um, the, the two photos show two extremes. We, we have one um, picture here that shows the, the, bra the interseeded radish, the brassica species that is really not going to produce a whole lot of biomass in the fall and really is not going to provide a whole lot of cover crop benefits. So we should think about maybe the timing of when we planted that to improve the benefits. But again, that, that green biomass we see in the fall isn't going to be there in the spring. We look at the, the photo on the right. Again, we can think if we, we plant a, a monoculture of brassicas, we're going to have a field that is, um, the, the soil is, has been loosened and is very prone to erosion. So we th should think about planting these species with a grass cover crop that again is going to need to be terminated in the spring. Finally, legumes are going to require some termination depending on what species you plant. And again, we, we covered few, a few of the common ones um, are going to winter kill like crimson clover, um, peas, uh, but red clover and vetch, they're going to need to have a termination pass down in the spring. Um, a few of these are good candidates for crimping. You can see that on the slide. Uh, mowing may be an option for a couple of these if we're going to terminate them in the same year that they're planted, but the, the species that overwinter are, are not going to be species where we mow. Um, and then tillage, of course, is always an option in the toolbox, but again, I'm going to advise against it unless we absolutely have to for our cropping rotation. Um, when we think about terminating legumes, I'm going to recommend an application of a glyphosate product coupled with a growth regulator herbicide. Um, and these will provide adequate control of these cover crops and any weed species that are out in that field hiding out underneath that cover crop residue. We think about what to do if we're going to do a forage harvest of some of these cover crops. So we have winter rye and annual ryegrass. We're going to harvest these species around boot stage um, for the winter rye. And what's that going to look like if we allow those to regrow? So the very front of this photo shows winter rye um, two weeks after harvest. And we do get a little bit of regrowth. But, you know, we're talking about five to six inches of regrowth. We can easily plant into that and clean that up with a post-emergent application. And your ryegrass, however, though, quickly regrow, produce quite a bit of biomass after harvest, and that would be a clear weed and, and provide some pretty strong competition to whatever crop we planted back into that. We think about harvesting that winter rye or annual ryegrass for forage value and then spraying it the same day. So this research showed that we could go out, we could harvest our winter rye and annual ryegrass, 
take that biomass off the plot, store it for feed value, and then we could go out and spray it the very same day and we could have excellent control after two weeks um, with just a burn down application of glyphosate. And then finally, we look at glyphosate alone on these cover crops. So in this particular instance, we're leaving that cover crop residue on the, on the soil. We wanna go out and we wanna spray those cover crops off. We could go out and plant into that residue. Um, I also want to encourage producers to explore their options when it comes to managing this cover crop residue by ensuring that they have proper plant set, planter setups to plant into that residue um, and consider modifying their equipment to, for optimum success in these residues, high residue systems. Cover crops and crop insurance. Um, we want to always ask our, our crop insurance agent and check our policies to avoid future problems with our crop insurance. And, and cover crop termination um, can be quite simple for crop insurance reasons. However, there are some, some reasons why we, sh we should investigate a little bit further and talk to our agent to ensure that there's no problems down the road. I also want to encourage producers to terminate their cover crops under good weather conditions. So when the cover crop's actively growing, um, when the daytime temperatures are above 50 degrees and the nighttime temperatures are below 40 or above 40 degrees rather, um, when that cover crop is actively growing and ensure that the sprayer is set up for optimum application to ensure success if you're going to use a herbicide to terminate your cover crop. With that, I'd welcome any questions and, and emails at the, the phone and, and uh, email address on the screen, as well as reaching out to your local extension educator for more information. <music>